Hey everybody, welcome to the Zen Top Live. Today we're going to be talking about taking a mold and lightweighting it, and there's quite a few reasons why we would want to do that. Uh, let's take a look at the file I have prepared for you today. So what I have here is my CAD model of this mold, right? And again, NTOP is here to complement your CAD tool, so I'm going to design this mold over in CAD. And then I'm going to come over to NTOP to lightweight it, and today we're going to be lightweighting it by infilling it with a lattice. And we're not just going to be doing anything too simple. We're going to be infilling it with a variable lattice, we're going to use a variable shell, and we're going to apply a variable blend radius. We're going to be doing quite a lot of advanced work to make sure this part is as light as we can possibly get it, but also as strong as it needs to be. Now, why would we want to lightweight this mold? Well, there's a couple reasons. And in this example here, we're actually talking about a mold that is 3D printed out of resin. So these, these molds that are 3D printed out of resin are typically used for things like prototyping or small production runs. And the lighter we can get this mold, the less material we use, the lower the cost to create the mold or the lower the barrier to entry. But also in this printing process for the resin, the less surface area per layer, the faster it prints. So if we can speed up the print time and reduce the material usage, we're just reducing the, the entry cost as much as possible. And that's why we're going down this path. However, everything I'm showing you today, all the technology here can be applied to any mold that you have, whether it's, it's you know um, metal, whether it's resin, whether it's plastic, whatever it might be, everything we're talking about here can be used for whatever you might need. Now, let's take a look at what's going on. And again, like I said, we are starting from CAD, and we're going to be focusing in on just the bottom half of this mold. We're starting with this, this bottom half of the mold, and what we need to do first is run a static analysis, right? So we need to mesh this part, and we need to <laughs> see where the stresses are, where the deformation is. And here you can see this color map of my deformation. So we can see it's deforming up on there. We have our, our stresses in our part here. And now we can actually have a baseline, right? Now, if we take a look, we, we can see we have 14 megapascals. That's our maximum stress. I went ahead and also calculated out the maximum displacement in inches. And right now, our maximum displacement is about 1.1 thou, right? Which is not very much at all. And we actually know, to stay within our tolerances here, we can actually have around 7 thou of you know, total displacement if we so chose. So we have a little bit of, of room to work with in this case. Now, why don't we take a, a quick look at the actual loading conditions itself? So if I turn back on my mold here, we have a clamping force of about 20,000 pounds, and that is being applied to this face here, where the top and bottom halves of our mold would be meshing together. We are holding several of these sides fixed in their normal directions here, top, bottom, left, right. These sides, and it's, it's a little bit tough to see a little bit much going on on the screen there, but these sides are being held fixed in their normal direction. So in this case, these guys cannot move left or right, but they can move up and down. And we're doing that to all of these sides, so we're not getting any of that rigid body motion, and it's held in place properly. And that is based upon the actual you know, machine and process for, for this mold that it would be going through. So these loading conditions might change for any mold that you have. But once we do that, we get our needed information, stress, displacement, all that sort of stuff, we can start working on actually modifying this design. And that's what happens in this next section here. So what I'm doing, I was taking this mold, and instead of having it in CAD data, now I'm into the implicit world. And now I'm going to go ahead and shell this geometry here. Now you'll also notice this shell is not just a normal shell. It's not uniform in size. And you can see inside of here, I am changing from about a 10 millimeter thick shell, tapering all the way down to about a three millimeter shell at the very bottom here. And you can really see that happening here on the leftmost corner, how much thicker it is at the top versus all the way at the bottom. And the reason we're doing this is so that we can save as much weight as we possibly can while keeping our part only strong where it needs the strength. And on these side walls, this isn't where we need the strength. And we know that from our previous static analysis. So we're able to make this choice here. Now I take this, I have to, again, take the shell. I need to grab the lattice volume, right? This is all the volume where my lattice can exist. And now I'm going to go ahead and create this uniform lattice. And we can take a look inside of there. And you'll notice if I zoom in, these lattice beams, a little muddy here, but I can 
maybe clean them up a little bit for you. A little muddy on my lattice beams, but they are extremely thin. And right now these lattice beams are at the minimum thickness that our printing process can handle, the absolute minimum. They're as small as possible and their spacing is as large as we can possibly go to still be able to be completely self-supporting in the printing process. So we're going with the absolute smallest lattice that we can possibly have in terms of in terms of mass. So that's where we're starting. We're then going to take this infilled model and we're going to run it through a static analysis. So we're going to go ahead and grab both the uniform shell or sorry, the, the shell here. We're going to take a mesh of, of this guy. We're going to take the mesh. You can see the volume ele elements inside of there. And we're going to make use of a beam based lattice mesh. So instead of fully performing a tetrahedral mesh on, on this lattice, which would take millions of, <laughs> of cells and, and facets, that, which would just be take forever, we're actually going to perform a beam-based uh, simulation, which is going to be much quicker in, in terms of computation time, but slightly less accurate, right? It's a little less accurate. You, you have to have that trade-off, but it does tend to overestimate your maximum values rather than underestimate. So this will kind of give us a built-in factor of safety. We're going to give it the material properties, right? We're going to load it in the same way. You can see that all happening here. And then we're going to come to our first uh, analysis of this infill. We can see the displacements here. And again, I have calculated our maximum stress, maximum displacement. And now if we take a look at this, I have a maximum displacement of 27, almost 28 thou, which is much bigger than I said, that figure of about seven, right? So that's okay. That's what we needed to know. But now we also, if I take a look at this point map down here, we can see the distribution of stress in the lattice structure itself. And that's what I wanted. I'm going to be using this information. We're going to turn it into this field of data. And I'm going to use the actual values of stress in these extremely thin beams to make them thicker where the stress is higher, right? So I'm going to be using a very well-informed field of data to modify my lattice now. So now I'm going to go take this data and create this variable infill. And you can see here this thickened body. I am now variably infilling my lattice. And it's pretty apparent to the eye here. And you, what you can see I'm doing, I'm pulling the minimum and maximum values of stress. I'm using a slightly uh, higher or lower value from the minimum or maximum. You know, FEA, you got to account for, for the overestimations and things like that. So I'm using those values to directly drive my lattice info. You can see getting very thick on the edges here. If I make a section cut of this, you can see on the interior as well, where we have all of that stress, we have this really nice, thick, solid lattice to give us all of this strength that we need. And we got that all from this wonderful stress analysis that we did in the previous step here, right? That's how we're informing this lattice. Then what I'm gonna do is the same exact thing. So we, we created this lattice, I'm gonna join it back together and I'm gonna run another static analysis on this block. But now this time we have a variable shell and a variably driven lattice. So we can see the deformation, we can see the stress. I can turn on that same point map view and we can look inside of here and see that our stress has certainly gone down. And we can see that because I pulled out again, the maximum displacement and the maximum values of stress. So now we have about 6.5 thou of maximum displacement once we change these values of our thickness, right? So now we're within our allowable deformation and we're still, we have about 99 megapascals of stress with our material. We know we're not yielding yet or we're not plastically deforming. So we're still within that good region, right? We're still doing pretty well there. Now at the end, I can take a look at my parts. I can say, okay, we finally hit all of the values we needed. We're, we're deforming only within our allowable amounts. We still have uh, no plastic deformation or anything like that occurring. And now we can take a look and actually, you know, take a look at some of the statistics here. If we look at my final infilled mold, however, I also, inside of here, if you'll notice this blend radius has a ramp inside of it. So when I joined together my lattice and my shell, I'm actually changing the blend radius based upon the amount of stress in, in the part at that region. So where the beam is bigger, i.e. where the stress is higher, I have a much larger blend radius, right? I'm going from a one millimeter to two millimeters. So I'm doubling my blend radius where I have a lot of stress so that I can ensure 
those stress concentrations that might arise are not going to happen, or at least they'll be minimized as much as possible. And again, I'm in complete and total control of every single piece of this geometry. And at the end of the day, I'll notice that I calculated my weight savings here, and I reduced the mass by 35%, right? 35% of my mass has been reduced, which is a fantastic result. That means I can essentially reduce my material cost by 35% as well, which is drastically reducing the upfront cost of this mold to be produced, right? So that's going to allow some other companies or, or people that need some low production runs or prototyping, it's going to encourage them to go this route you know, a little bit more easily than maybe beforehand. And thanks to NTOP's reusable workflows, the process to do this wasn't too hard. I had to set up a couple static analysis uh, and, and you know things along the way, but all I had to do is once I got here, I'm changing up the values of my lattice and I'm just letting it rerun and rerun and rerun and tell me my max displacement, tell me my max stress. And I just continuously change these values, not having to do anything else, letting, letting the analysis finish. And then I'm presented with my final part again. And I just kept going, exploring my design space until I met my requirements. It was as hassle-free as designing something this complex could possibly be. I think this is a really fantastic example, uh, really great results at the end of the day. And I think this could be certainly adapted, right? Now we have this template and of course you have access to this file. So now I have this template for you. If you're thinking about lightweighting molds, whether it's printed out of metal, whether it's uh, maybe a hybrid approach, you, you print part of this out of metal so you can get this nice lattice structure, but make it as lightweight as possible. You machine the actual, you know, high details, high tolerance portions uh, of the mold so you can get that accuracy that you're looking for, right? This can be taken into a hundred different ways and this template is made for you. So this process, this application of lightweighting molds is not just able to be used for this resin application I'm talking about, right? We could take this in a hundred different directions. So thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, of course, always ask them. Uh, and I look forward to speaking to you guys again soon.